I've done this before. I, I composed this story and read it in 2005. And it was just after um, the appeals court, um, Ninth Circuit, ruled against Kamehameha schools and decided that their admissions policy was discriminatory. That was since reversed um, by an unbank um, court ruling. But at the time, we didn't know what was going to happen. So that's the context of the story. I was standing at the tomb of the Kamehamehas about a month ago, holding a traditional feathered standard known as a kahili, alongside the portrait of the princess Bernice Powahib, who had left her entire estate to found and maintain the Kamehameha schools. How I came to be holding this kahili on a very solemn day which by its very solemnity had conferred upon this task a kind of awesome responsibility, I cannot say. I was simply in the wrong place in the wrong time and had greatness in the form of this kahili thrust into my hands. Not that I would begrudge the princess anything. She is my great benefactor and really an ancestor. And after all, for four years, I had stood in the hot sun at attention, wearing dress blues and carrying a ceremonial M1 rifle in parades that honored her, her husband, her trustees, the president of the schools, Hiram Bingham, Alibaba and the 40 Thieves, for all I know, four times a year at the hottest part of a Sunday afternoon muttering curses at the trustees and the president, never at her, for having to do this in the first place. Actually, in my senior year, I got to trade my M1 in for a saber when I was made the deputy brigade commander and didn't even have to march in the parades myself, but did have to sit and make polite conversation with the trustees and the president in their turns. So here I was nearly 40 years later, standing in the sun in a bright red aloha shirt, holding her kahili and trying to look dignified while hundreds of people filed past the tombs of her ancestors, leaving floral gifts, chants, and prayers in the wake of the Doe versus Kamehameha decision. People were sad, but defiant, and many of them had composed chants and poetry to recite to our chiefs as they laid their offerings at the tomb. It was all very well for them. You know, they, they got to leave and get into their air-conditioned SUVs as soon as they were done, while I kept surreptitiously looking into the crowd to see how long this line really was and estimating how much longer I would need to stand there guarding my princess. I meditated a lot that morning. Reasoning that I could go nowhere until this was over, I started remembering my days as a cadet at Kamehameha, thinking that if Kamehameha were today the same kind of school it had been when I was there, there might not be so many applications every year. Not that Kamehameha wasn't a good school then, but it was certainly an odd place to spend your formative years. Imagine a boarding school for native Hawaiian children operated and staffed almost entirely by haoles, some of whom were extremely, terrifyingly, calcifyingly old, who almost single-mindedly single considered us students as fundamentally untrustworthy, academically dense, but preternaturally clever when we turned our minds to tormenting them and breaking their rules. Nothing illustrates this re relationship better than the house mothers of my seventh grade, seventh and eighth grade dormitories. I still remember their names and their particular weaknesses. <laughs> Ruth Scheidler, Leona Dowdy, and then there was Claire Grayson, not her real name a New Englander. She was the head house mother of our seventh grade boys dormitory. Our dorm was named after a former principal, Maud Post. And as there were two separate wings of the dorm, ours was called 
Maud Post East. Apparently, Maud Post had been principal early in the century when Mrs. Grayson was still a young woman. Or maybe not. It was hard to tell. <laughs> no one knew how old Mrs. Grayson was, but it was ru rumored among the boys that her husband had died of old age before the First World War. <laughs> we only knew that she was a widow, as most of the house mothers were. Even in 1964, we were living in an age when no one divorced, and husbands mercifully perhaps died sometime before their wives. <laughs> Who knew how long Mrs. Grayson had been widowed? We wondered if she had children and where they were. It seemed sometimes like she had never been around 12-year-old boys before. Or if she had, it had been so long ago that she had forgotten what we were like. Not that she wasn't usually decent to us, though kind would have been too strong a word to describe her. She rarely raised her voice except once, when she allowed herself to become somewhat hysterical. I still remember the event so clearly. Our rooms were along a narrow hallway that ended on one side at a large reception desk receptionist kind of desk, where she habitually stayed when she was on duty. Behind the desk was the door to her apartment, which I believe was a studio apartment with its own bath and kitchen. I do not know this for sure, um, because I never tried to break into her apartment or peer through the small rectangular window on her door. She had a small rectangular window, and all of the house mothers would cover the inside of that window with foil or cardboard. Some of my dorm mates claimed to have looked into her apartment through a small corner of the foil that didn't quite cover the entire window. Not through any kind of curiosity, but mostly because they understood it was not a good thing to do. <laughs> it was certainly dangerous since it involved going behind that reception desk where no one was ever allowed. Every door to every student's room had such a window, and we were all forbidden to cover them with anything, on the theory, I suppose, that we should never have complete privacy. But it would have made no difference if we had covered those windows, since we were forbidden to ever close our doors while we were in our rooms. Though we were allowed to lock them whenever we left them in order to prevent our belongings from being immediately stolen by our comrades. The lesson of the doors was that we, all of us would instantly misbehave the moment no one could see us, and we would steal anything we could lay our hands on. I still think of those boys who claimed to have picked the lock on Mrs. Grayson's door and gone inside just to see how she lived as prepubescent revolutionaries on the order of Cesar Chavez or Jean-Paul Marat, striking a blow for respecting the lower classes although they were also such inveterate liars, and so it's hard to tell for sure whether they ever did such a thing. One thing I know they did was that someone left a clean pair of briefs, known as BVDs, hanging on the door of her apartment. I know that someone must have placed the article of clothing on her door while she was making rounds after lights out, between 9, so, between 9 and 9.15, when she would take her flashlight and walk down the hallway, aiming it into each room on the right and the left to see that every, be every bed had a reposing figure. Why BVDs? Well, for one thing, the dress for bedtime was uniform and unbreachable. We had to wear pajamas, a top and bottom, and no one was allowed to wear underwear, like BVDs, under their pajamas. I swear to God, this is true. <laughs> How did the house mothers check? One of the larger and more imposing boys on the floor was given the task of rubbing his hand along the pajama-clad thighs of each boy to make sure that there was nothing worn underneath. I have so much trouble understanding um, 
understanding this now, but it's fairly clear that the creator of these policies was deeply, deeply disturbed. <laughs> Not only did this practice violate the personal space of each and every boarding child, but we were made complicit as stooges in the whole process. Clearly, someone had waited until she had passed his room and gambling that she would no, not look, turn and look back down the hall, had crept behind the reception desk with his underwear and hung it like a knight errant's trophy on her doorknob. The disturbing Freudian overtones of this were not apparent to us at the time. In fact, most of us were obliviously heading for dreamland when the lights in the hall went on and Mrs. Grayson was walking through the halls, demanding that every boy immediately come out and line up outside the doors. This late night inquisition had happened before, always in the wake of some terrible misbehavior. Once when Samuel Baker, a child even smaller than me, had been talked into trying to slide th through the second floor laundry chute having been told it was really fun to land two floors down on a pile of laundry. There was, sadly, no pile of laundry. And he wound up with a severely sprained ankle and a large bump on his head. To his credit, he refused to name the boys who had talked him into this, and we all found ourselves in the hall after lights out, listening to Mrs. Grayson tell us how sheltering a criminal only made us criminals too. But this night was different. The violation of Mrs. Grayson's space was, as it turned out, only a part of the complaint she had against us. But the far more grievous sin was that we had quite clearly banded together against her. She told us that she was absolutely sure that no one would ever reveal the culprit who had hung his underwear on her door, because everyone in the dormitory would certainly have done the same thing if given the chance. Every night when I walked down the hall to do the bed check, I can hear you all whispering, here she comes, here she comes. <laughs> and I know that you're up to mischief and that you think you're getting away with something. That's what really makes me sick is that you're all in this together. I remember thinking that this was not the time to tell her that neither I nor my roommate Ralph Diffin had ever said, here she comes. Ralph, Ralph being the sort of young man who minded his own business and followed the rules, and I being the sort of person who knew that I would be caught if I ever did anything daring. In truth, it was only a handful of boys who had decided to make a crusade of tormenting Mrs. Grayson. As a good public speaker, even then, I thought it might be my responsibility to give a stirring defense of the dormitory using the well-worn metaphor of a few bad apples spoiling it for the rest of us. But then we realized in horror that Mrs. Grayson was sobbing. Here she comes. Here she comes indeed. What terrible children you are. Not a trace of goodness. Not an ounce of sympathy for someone without family. So far from home. And only you for company. I was stunned not just at this display of adult weakness and need, though that was frightening enough, but that I could be touched just by that. I looked around the hall and saw the same looks of shame and squirming discomfort on every face. She turned and went back into her apartment without ever telling us to go back to bed. And we all just stood in the doorways for several minutes afraid not that she would return and scold us for leaving the hallway before she dismissed us, but that she would not return. Finally, Roy Horner told us we should go to bed, and we did. The next morning, Mrs. Grayson was behind the desk as always when we woke up to ready ourselves for school. She never again mentioned the evening, and we minded ourselves for the rest of the year. And maybe much longer than that. I remember all of the boys in Wad Post East that year, and we share some things in common these many years since. I'm not sure if it's entirely correct to say that we are more compassionate than others. It's more like that 
collectively we seem to recognize human frailties and tend to be profoundly uncomfortable with personal cruelty. There's something about these doormates that separates us from even the other seventh grade boarders who were in Mod Post West. A kind of wary acknowledgement of our own imperfections and a quicker inclination to forgive. More than anything else, we seem to possess a kind of gentleness, especially around the elderly, but maybe in part from some wellspring of our Hawaiian culture, but I believe connects powerfully with the realizations we had that night. People are vulnerable to others, and that vulnerability is what commands respect and brings out goodness and generosity in us all. I came back from my memories out there at the tomb of the Kamehamehas when it started to rain, and I worried about what the rain might do to the feathers of the kahili. We were down to the last two or three groups of people who would present the floral symbols of their aloha to Princess Pawahi and their loyalty to all the rest of us. I looked out at a particularly elderly woman with what looked like three generations of her offspring with her. I thought how fortunate she is to be surrounded by her family and then realized that this is indeed why we were there on that day, being vulnerable with each other, expressing our pain and sadness at the court's decision that might begin the breakup of our family, and doing whatever was needed to soften the blow for each other. We were all bearing the latest blow to Hawaiians as a family. I still think it ironic that a New England haole, who might not have been particularly fond of me and the rest of my dorm mates, had probably taught us as much about the importance of family and aloha as anyone in our own ohana. Mrs. Grayson did not return to Maud Post East the next year, and I do not mean to suggest that we children missed her. But because of her, there is something we did not miss an important lesson that allows us to this day to value our humanity as we recognize it in others. Thank you.